Hey guys, today I'm joined by Max Hoven, best-selling comic creator and yes. film producer. Max, how you doing? Hey, I'm good. <laughs> awesome. Thanks for joining us. So, real quick, prior to the recording, we were talking about um, that you had come across me through Niobe Comics and Tyler talking smack about me. And... Uh, well, that's the only way you ever encountered, like, or knew who I was. I, I quickly want to, like, touch base on that as to, like, number one, do you know why they were talking smack about me initially? Uh, sort of. I mean, uh, in a general sense, it's not like I'm watching their content and then I see them bring you up. It's more like... <sighs> I think um, I, just in the YouTube algorithm, your videos popped up simultaneously as, you know, Niobe Comics videos pop up and Tyler's videos pop up. And I just happen to recognize that they're all covering the same thing because I guess throughout like a week or two, you guys were kind of making videos back and forth on each other. Now, I have been following Tyler and I've been following... Niobe, just as, you know, fellow independent comic creators for probably like two years. Right. And, you know, whenever they make content, it doesn't always pop up to the top of my feed unless it's getting traction. And those videos started to gain traction. Mm. So, and then uh, I think I watched um, two or three videos that were yours and then... Uh, I think I don't think I saw anything that Tyler made, but I remember the initial video that you made was like mainly commenting on Tyler's art and basically just saying it's just not really up to professional caliber and or yeah. something along those lines. And um, his response was, or I, I don't remember exactly, but my take was just initially Niobe was like. Uh, this referring to you or coffee comics just has kind of an outrageous standard of what it means to be a professional. <laughs> and then your take was essentially, no, uh, I'm just saying that you should strive to do your best and not make trashy work in a sense. And yeah. I think their whole take was just like, well, we're not making bad comics deliberately. We're just, you know, we're not expecting to make the most phenomenally big hit, IP that out there, I don't know. It just seemed to me like kind of exaggerated, I guess, on both ends. But you just have a very strong message that you put out, you know. <laughs> so it can come across, I think, as you know, insulting or something. Yeah, that's really not my fault, bro. Like, um, I I say I refer to people who just can't handle being called a spade a spade, sissy boys, man babies, <laughs> hunchbacks, you know, and it's it's common sense to strive to do better otherwise you're just doing it as a hobby but you're treating it as if it's your profession a profession means that you specialize in something you know and these guys definitely do not specialize in the craft it, it just looks like a hobby done after school before you do your homework you know so i had expected when i had come into the indie uh comic space that oh there's going to be people who are part of this community who are going all out and doing their best uh, despite their circumstance because, you know, we all have our own unique circumstance. But nonetheless, they, they were not doing that. They were not trying to do their best. So I was mad. Uh, but your conclusion overall on my message uh, and theirs was was what ultimately as to like, okay, these guys are, you said they exaggerate. Um, but I'd like to know it's like, who was right? I'm just curious. Who was right? <laughs> oh, I mean, not to really play both sides is them, but it, it, I really just see it straight down the middle. When we're on YouTube, we essentially play characters of ourselves, you know, and, and that's maybe not, 100% true for you, but mm -hmm. it, it's just how I, it's like how I talk to my, you know, on YouTube, it's not the same way I talk to my friends. 
And it's not the same way I talk to my boss. And it's not the same way I talk to my wife, you know, and things like that. So whenever I say exaggerated, it's more like I'm, I see you as taking your YouTube personality as I have my following, which uh, I forget what you kind of call your following, but it's like, we are a team that's dedicated to quality. And mm. it's like, you stress that. Like, we are a team that's dedicated to creating high quality content. And that's plain and simple. You may have some other additions to that, but that's my general take. Now, when it comes from Tyler and Niobe's perspective, I think they see it as, in general, they thrive upon controversy in a sense. That's why they made videos about it. That's why they pushed your comments further and went back and forth. Um, but their, I think, general take on the like more soft side is that they're just, yes, it's a hobby. They try to make it as professional as possible. They take it serious. That's why they uh, make videos. That's why they've been in this community for a long time. And um, they're, But they're still just like, yeah, but you can be a professional in this space without always putting out, you know, whatever. It doesn't have to be top quality. You don't have to be the best of the best to be considered a professional. And they're basically just saying there's some of us that are in this space that do it as a hobby like you said, but we also take it seriously and we consider that professional in its own sense. They've been in indie comics a long time. They're leaders of their own groups and that has its own respect, I guess, so to speak. Okay. So they are professional hobbyists basically um, because there's a professional standard in every industry. They do not meet that standard. And uh, the fact that they rely on Kickstarters most of the time, well, you can't pay the mortgage off with Kickstarters because most of that money needs to be used to ship everything uh, out. And Tyler well, that's, admitted that's that. partially true. I'm trying to prove that later because most of my content actually argues sort of the benefits of the traditional market, but also I'm going to start diving into, if I use the same methods that I use to become to get as many sales as I do through the direct market and try to do it directly through Kickstarter. There's plenty that just crush it on Kickstarter more than they ever do in the traditional market. I think it's just the majority of the work that's on there, they don't go through the same motions that they would through a traditional publisher to market and promote it. So they just aren't reaching the same numbers. But if someone does it professionally, like you see with Berserker or whenever big professional companies take on and go t to Kickstarter, they wait, they make, you know, outrageously more amounts than they would going yeah. through the comic shops. That's true. Um, Kenneth Rockefeller, I'm sure you know him, right? Uh, maybe if I saw the name right now, it's not ringing a bell. Okay, well, he's uh, one of the legends. We work for DC, Marvel, Top Cow. He makes a lot of money, hundreds and thousands of dollars on Indiegogo. He releases his book, uh, Groken, every year. And that's because it's Kenneth Rockefeller. He understands that, well, the main, if I were to sell this thing through the main market, I have to be published maybe under Image or Dark Horse, and they would take a, a huge percentage. And he's not about that. Since he's an established artist who's been in the game for years, um, he's got his fan base and he can totally uh, live a, a long, sustainable life through Indiegogo. But for the average Joe, some of us who have never been in Marvel and so on, I don't think it's fully sustainable at all. And I dislike seeing others who want to celebrate so highly, like, yay, I met my Kickstarter guys. But it's like, dude, it won't make a difference. Like, honestly, the only thing you can do with that is buy Starbucks for the next three months, you know? So... Um, people will call me negative, I think for my, that, but it's real. I do agree with you there. I, so, but I, I will like defend on that side of it. There is a lot of people. So for, for number one, it's like most people, even if they make their Kickstarter goal, let's say they, their goal is five grand that, that might, might cover the bare minimum cost to cover even a 
you know, one floppy, a 22, 24, even 32 page issue might. And a lot of people don't even get that through Kickstarter. But that being said, a lot like you, like kind of the thing is that maybe that's the distinguish from what your point is, is a lot of the independent comic creators aren't trying to be, you know, ultra hit people. They're just trying to make books that get, you know, they that makes a little, makes the money back, maybe has a little bit of an audience and so on. See, um, and, I would, uh, I would appreciate that if initially it was, uh, made known that guys, this is a hobby. This is no different to the granny who knits a Jersey and sells it at the yard sale every other month. That's what it is. You know, I thought that we're going all in here. We're going all in here to actually change our lives for the better. But all these people were treating it as if it changes their lives. But there are all the grannies knitting a Jersey and selling it at the yard sale. And I was like, but that you can't make a real difference if this is how you're treating this thing, you know, and it has led many people astray because when I was young, I thought that, oh, you can make significant returns um, by just doing the Kickstarter route or so on, but not really, you know, not really. You have to be somewhat have an established name, but oh, well, um, real quick. Yeah, about- there's really no way to just mm. go to Kickstarter, post your book and then suddenly get a following with without any externalities like trying to build an audience outside of the platform Mm -hmm. even those that have a amazing perfect book just going strictly through kickstarter isn't going to get them across that threshold to actually like make it a profession all right that's yeah agreed so about you though i remember discovering your youtube someone sent me a youtube channel and i forgot what the context was but the first thing I noticed was why, if, if Max is a bestseller and um, a film producer, but bestseller, how is it that his views are not so much? And tell us, what are you a bestseller of? When did you get this title, bestseller? And uh, what, I, what are you actually known for? Because I, I had never known you prior to the guy sending me your, your YouTube. Yeah, that's, that's, I'm glad I finally, I can sort of explain this step by step to people because most people find me now through YouTube, but people don't, I I actually built my fan base of like the thousands to get me a bestseller before I had YouTube. So as initially the step by step of my career, so to speak in comics, as much as I, you know, you can stress it as like, oh, I'm this bestseller. I'm a film producer. When you look at it behind the scenes and you see what I did step by step, it's not quite as like, oh, grandiose as it can, as I sort of make it sound. Uh, essentially, I'm a bestseller because my comic book, which became a graphic novel called It Eats What Feeds It, became sort of viral in the indie community in 2020. It released in the summer of 2020 in the heat of the pandemic, and it was the number one best selling series for Scout Comics. At the time, Scout Comics itself wasn't that known and my book's success it basically sold out three different times it went to fourth printings for the first issue all the subsequent issues second and third they sold out as well whenever i say sell out though what people have to understand is these print runs were like two thousand three thousand six thousand they weren't that high um but because each it, it sort of went like viral the way comics in their direct market work is you kind of don't hit any kind of like if there's a delay, which in like word of mouth, uh, like so people start soliciting the publishers solicit to the comic shops before anyone really reads the book. Um, reviewers can get like early access. Now I went through a lot of motions to get the book in front of a lot of people. But what happened was once the book was released, I got a lot of really great reviews and then a lot of other YouTubers like Comic Tom 101, um, a few others uh, reviewed it, gave it these kind of high ratings, so to speak. And then C.B. Sapolsky, the editor in chief of uh, Marvel Comics at the time, still is, but uh, 
he quoted about it on Twitter, and it kind of had the second wave that trumped all the other printings. So, like, the third printing was twice as big as the other two combined. So that was, like, the bestseller status is, like, I'm bestseller with Scout. Um, and then that then allowed the graphic novel to also sell out as well. Um, wow. You can also say I'm an Amazon bestseller, but I was only a bestseller for a day. And almost anybody can be an Amazon bestseller if they want to, because you can just sort of force everybody to buy it on the first day and so speak. But that, right. that was initially the launch to my career. And that was before YouTube or anything. And then once after that, uh, I was... You could basically say I'm a bestseller with Liquid Kill because it it's one of the best-selling independent comics of 2023. It was in the top 10%. I think it launched at over 20,000 issues sold. Wow. Which now is – that's becoming less rare. Um, but it, it's, uh, even at the time, it was still – you don't see indie comics that sell that high. Yeah, you really don't. Um, Liquid Kill, is it published with – What's it published? It was with? initially published with What Not Publishing, which then rebranded to what's now called Massive Publishing. Hmm. Okay. No, this is uh this is really interesting because for so long, right, ever since I came on on the scene on YouTube, we've been trying to diagnose how is it that online indie creators are struggling to sell to the main market. And I had said that, well, because on the internet, most people who find you first are aspiring artists. It's not the real consumer who would go in the shop, right? Aspiring artists are your first customers, and they'd only buy your stuff if they personally like you, like your personality, like how you say things or so on, not because of your product. And even Tyler himself admitted that most of his customers are aspiring artists. Um, I don't know about his book sales in stores, but oh well. So in your case, before you even came to YouTube, you managed to sell such high copies. But here's the thing I also had mentioned is that how can this be um, that there's someone like you, but we never heard of you? Where are the people, the people who buy your books, why don't they make enough reviews about it? You know, you mentioned one dude, th those few people who made the reviews, but it's not enough. Where are the people uh, discussing your story? Because an interview I had recently with the creator of Tomahawk Angel, published with Dark Horse, ever heard of it? Uh, that sounds familiar, but I don't, I definitely haven't read it. All right. Um, it's a horror style manga published with Dark Horse, and he was discovered on Top Pass. Um, I asked him, how did you find my channel? And he said, oh, I was just searching for Tomahawk Angel content on YouTube, wanting to see if did anyone make a video about it thus far or, or not. And he said he found me, right? And I was like, oh, oh, you found somebody else as well who was like, hey, I, I bought all these manga and Tomahawk Angel was one of it. But ultimately I saw that artists want genuine feedback from their consumers. It's one thing to get those comments online, oh, this is great, this is nice. But what about actually expanding on it? What, what do you like about it? He was looking for that, and I have encountered many who DM'd me saying, bro, I'd like genuine feedback. That's why you know, I do paid reviews as well, because these artists are not getting proper um, genuine feedback on their material they just getting the the general dopamine response like nice job great without probably even reading it and in your case you it's a bestseller most people online though ain't talking about it how does how does that make you feel like do you do you care about that or you don't care because well the money is uh better than people's words uh, how does it feel for you? Uh, so the pro the majority, if you want to be like, well, who's reading this book? The the primary place that people read it was they didn't actually buy it. So I got you know probably huh, an, an, like thousands upon thousands of people that read it for free through Hoopla. So in America we have a library system 
that you can that if you have a library card in your city, which almost anybody that wants to read, any reader in America has a library card. And once the digital revolution took place, Hoopla is basically you can read anything for free through your local library as long as you have a library card and your library is associated with this platform called Hoopla. You can then download the books or at least read on Hoopla any book. Wow. And I got hundreds. I mean, and then those you can look up on Goodreads, genuine, hardcore people that love it, hate it. I've, I think I've got like 350 reviews, like written reviews through Hoopla and uh, um, Goodreads. So like it, it gained a huge following all for free, really. But that word of mouth of people basically, you know, giving their honest feedback, you know, it wasn't like everybody gave it five stars. The majority of people said the same thing, which I talked about in my YouTube videos of basically what they liked about it, what they didn't. And all of them are really obvious their their complaints that they should have is basically the truth you know the book was shorter than it should have been it was three issues when it probably should have been four um and so it to a lot of people it felt rushed at the end so yeah I, I read all those reviews um or maybe not all of them but a good portion of them people that actually wrote written feedback um so th there's not necessarily people and since it's a short story it's not like people are gonna go it's not like, you know, where people, they start whole fandoms. Um, and it, it's kind of just like a red, one and done. Here's what I liked. Here's what I didn't like. That's that. So it's not like I can really dive into my fan base. But it did allow, I also do a lot of things to capture my audience. I have my website. And that's why I started the YouTube channel was to sort of get those people that knew me through that to then follow me into my other series through my email lists and YouTube and I now just started like Facebook groups and stuff like that. I'm not as active as I should be. So it's hard for me to actually interact with a lot of people. But um, I get a lot of people that just reach out to me through email and you know, they talk to me. But a lot of that really kicked off once I started the YouTube. It wasn't immediately from my fans of it eats. But that's how most people found me and know me. Um. Now I forget the initial question. But basically, it was kind of like, how do you feel not being able to like actually hear honest feedback? The truth is I had a lot of feedback. Most okay. people don't receive as many reviews as I have through Hoopla and Goodreads, but that's a secret. There's a lot of, I got so much solid reviews and word of mouth because everybody was able to read it for free on Hoopla. And I guess like somehow it spread on that app and maybe people have like communities or like can like say what they, I'm not exactly sure how that app works, but people were talking about it on there and it just spread. So I got, you know, lots of people reading it through there. Wow, okay. Um, what would you say, what would you say made people um, like your stories so much, both um, What Feeds It and Liquid Kill? Because for the longest, I, on my channel, I say a lot of new stories are just zombie food, dopamine hits, slop. There is no extrapolations from reality. It doesn't inspire anyone. It just is targeted at the three primal instincts, fear, violence, and sexual imagery as a compensation for, um, you know, storytelling skills. So with yours, for it to have such an impact, um, what about it do you think is so great that made people like, wow, this is, this is new, this is fresh? For yeah, that's one. good. I, I, I've tried to pry into figuring that out, <laughs> and that's what I try to give people in my, uh, you know, th through my ebooks and stuff like that. But I think that in general, if if you want to break it down, like in reality, why did it latch on to people? Why did it immediately like sort of get traction? The number one answer is I had one of the best artists in the world, Gabriel Umazark. He also did the last broadcast. I found him because he did a book through Boom. That book is called The Last Broadcast. I didn't see him do really anything other than that at the time. That book came out in like 2013 or something like that. But I loved the book, loved the artwork, and I didn't really, hadn't really seen anybody that had a style like his. And I went through a long list of artists that I wanted to work with, knowing that I wanted to get one of the best, most unique artists to gather eyeballs. And then I also wanted somebody that had an established name 
credibility because they worked on one of the biggest publishers oh. and I happened to snag him. And he initially didn't like my initial story that I pitched him. What I pitched him initially was a huge, super non-emotionally appealing book, very dark horror. And he was like, why don't we do something along the lines of fantasy horror rather than kind of graphic gore horror. And I was like, yeah, I got that. <laughs> but and that's what Ed Eats and Feeds It became. So I said the number one draw is his artwork. That's what people got people in the door. Once people were in the door, I immediately snagged them because almost it's a very it's a very taboo story of just I think taboo themes always are gather more traction because supernatural fantasy uh, that can also probably fall into your category of just kind of like sexual draw or, or whatever, but it, it, it tends to have some kind of a, appeal to especially some, like the guys that are reading it because it's sort of fun. So, uh, to you know, imagine that kind of scenario you might be in. It's it's the classic. Just I'm in a scary house with an attractive woman, but she, you know it just seems too good to be true. But you know something's wrong there, you know. And just that first issue snags you because it's just like, yeah, who's gonna say no to this situation? It's just too weird and thrilling. And then yeah, I, and then I take you along this a story that's actually a lot darker than it is on its on its uh initial issue which is what people liked about it but also didn't like about it because it opens up you think it's going to be kind of this fun weird romp uh, and then it ends kind of quickly with this very oh dark undertones that's way more magic and less monster and way more kind of just <laughs> darker themes of society rather than kind of this fantastical love story um and so yeah just having that kind of story i think was enough to for people to be like, well, this is somewhat cliche, but somewhat, so it's like familiar enough to draw them in, but you know, not too weird enough to make them weirded out. So that, that has its, you know, wins and its fails. So it's, it's not like an amazing story, but it's just, it's good enough. And with an artwork or like an artist who's as good as Gabriel, it's hard to fail. <laughs> right. that, so that, like, that's my theory is like, I think Gabriel did 80% of the work. Uh, my writing partner and I were able to keep people engaged. And, uh, and then the rest was the marketing, which I can go into that. Yeah, before we go into that, um, you were describing both books that they have some taboo in them, right? Yeah. What sort of taboo? Uh, well, I can give you the fun version of Liquid Kill if you want. Oh, yeah, let's have it. So, okay, before I was into comics, I still, to this day, I manage hotels. Well, uh, but back in the day, in around 2012, I worked at a very famous historic hotel, uh, and it you got a lot of, when you work at hotels like that, it's, it's the classic stories where you hear of people like unusual elite, very wealthy people that will rent out entire wings, and they'll do weird stuff in the hotel. Right. Uh, they'll, you know, they'll rent litter boxes, even though they don't have pets, they'll rent or, you know, they, they just do weird stuff, it, eyes wide shut kind of things. Mm -hmm. And, uh, the hotel I worked at was like, uh, in a really interesting location in Yellowstone national park is right along this giant lake. It was very old. It had a lot of weird history about it. There were doors that led to nowhere. There were sections of it that were just, you know, abandoned and people weren't allowed in. That just didn't make sense. And I just ended up kind of writing this fantasy story about it. And it turned into um, sort of what now is people talking about the whole, like, ideas of secret islands where there's, uh, like, the Epstein Island kind of things. Oh, he but before rude. that story had ever, like, come out, mm. that, that was the entire initial premise based upon my experience of working at hotels if i just exaggerated in a future where everything is darker than you know if everything went the opposite direction you want to go uh so in that sense whenever i say taboo it's it's female centric and there and there's a lot of sexual trafficking and blood and art like organ harvesting undertones to the story 
which once by the time the book came out long after I wrote it, those themes are now like common in culture. Right. And those are more prominent ideas at the time. Those were like the most unheard of, <laughs> like there aren't possibly vampires in reality. It's like, well, what if they uh, didn't live forever because they're vampires? What if they live forever through science and technology and sacrifice and alchemy? Mm -hmm. And that was the that was that initial drawing. So anybody that was into that kind of stuff plus cyberpunk, I snagged them. And uh, I see. I did that through marketing them directly. In a way, um, kind of proves that I was right. In, in the end, one, you did extrapolate from reality, your reality, your experience, that historically creepy hotel. Without a doubt, these creepy rich people, we know what they're doing. So, I mean, it's it's open now. Uh, P. Diddy, uh, Epstein, yada, yada, yada. But yeah, ultimately... so yeah, now it's like mainstream. It was not at the time. In 2012, this was like the, exactly. the conspiracy of conspiracies. 2012, most things were... Um, Mainstream ba back then was all about this uplifting sort of uh, vibe in comics, uh, heroism, justice, positivity, the the Naruto aesthetic, you know, having it all colorful and so on. Now there's a lot of darker themes. And once again, everybody, I was right. I told y'all that the consumption rate or the, the desired... Um, food or appetite that consumers have for today is darker themes. You know, a bunch of hunchbacks said, oh, how are we supposed to analyze the, the psychology of the consumer today? So, well, look, a lot, look around you. Look what's popular. Ultimately, in the end, you did put every, those three primal instinct attributes that I mentioned. Um, it has to have yes, violence. Sure. It has to have fear vampires, gore, and sexual themes. That's the key. And I haven't read the story, of course, but if you say that, well, the story wasn't all that, your artists picked up um, most of the slack, well, I'll take your word for it. And above all else, well, he's a popular artist. I've never heard of him. You know, I've never seen this art style before because I'm looking at the covers and so on. But uh, for most Americans, I suppose they have. And that was one big thing that drew them in. Okay. Now, I, I'm glad you shared that because honestly, for so long, a lot have been under a delusion of just work hard and magically you'll be taken in. However, there is a guy called D.D. Mark um, who created something called Ruthless Render. Ever heard of it? I don't think so. Okay, he just got. I know DVNR, but not Ruthless Render. All right, um, he just got published by Dark Horse, and he got one million fake views on Manga Plus creators, and the article that was celebrating his publication was referencing that, and I was like, "Well, we know it's, it's fake, but oh well." Ultimately, he also sticks to the three primal instinct thing, the the dopamine. And because the guy is heavy, heavy, heavy duty when it comes to workload, he can dish out pages upon pages um, almost monthly or bi-monthly. So he's a very hard worker and he is a good artist, but he also rips a lot of things off from popular manga and his stuff is uh, just dopamine hits. It seems that it's enough for publishers to go, hey, we'll take you in because you fulfill... The, the, the desired appetite for majority of the consumers who are dopamine heads. They're not really... Yeah, I can, I can dive into that. Yeah, yeah. yeah please I mean, do, I, yes. Films. Please do. It, 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 it's, just, it's the same with films. So I've, as a film producer, I have literally taken movies and sold them to distributors and streaming platforms. And they do not care. I mean, I have literally had people buy the movie without ever seeing the movie. Wow. All that they care about is... How big is your audience? And then they look at the trailer and go, is that going to sell them people? They don't care what. And then they just make sure, does the film reach just bare minimum standards? Uh, does it reach a certain length? Uh, and does the actual video quality, like the actual cinematography, reach the standard that they is expected of the platform? 
and and the story has zero relevance to them. What? They don't care if that story is the best story that no one has ever heard of, and they don't care if it's just straight up slop written by AI. It's, <laughs> now, all they care about is just that: does it draw in the eyeballs, and does it hit that click ratio that they need? Um, and it's the same with comic publishers. Now, it's not to, uh, obviously apples to apples, but when it comes to what the factors that actually move the needle for sales, they know 80% of what it takes to get there. And all they have to do is they have to invest into 10 of them. And as long as one of those actually has a unique, a, a, a unique and expert story, because they, you know, they actually published those that had did 80% of the work. Whenever I say 80% of the work, it's like I said, does it have a killer cover? Uh, you know, it's the same as like with a film trailer. They just want to know, does how big is your audience? As like literally how many social media followers, email list followers. Now the publisher might not ask those questions, but they are looking at that kind of stuff. They will want to know if you have a YouTube channel, if you have an Instagram page, if you have a DeviantArt page, if you have worked with any other previous publishers. Now, as you go up the line, that might have less relevance. They might just want to know how well established are you in the creator community? Are there other well-known creators and publishers that have worked with this person in the past? Anyway, so those kinds of just bare minimum, easily observable standards, they'll just say, do they check these boxes? And if you do, there's a good chance that they're going to take you on. You have solid artwork, someone that has past writing experience that can be credible, even if that's as simple as you work with so-and-so in the past or that you have a college degree or whatever it is, um, your audience, and then and then they'll just say, what genre, they'll just look, what's the genre? If it's in a certain genre, especially like sub-genres that they don't already do, a lot of publishers latched on, like with my book, it was cyberpunk. They were like, we don't have a cyberpunk releasing right now. Uh, it's big. It's in the news. There's video games, whatever. Transhumanism is big right now. So that's a drawing factor. But, you know, but it doesn't have to have to be that. So they're just going to look at genre, creative team, and the actual artwork involved. And they don't care how the story ends. In fact, a lot of times, if they don't see it going that way, they might sign you. And then as if they think it's not like actually up to par, they'll just try to put in a different editor or hire somebody else to be like, here, we're going to just do these script edits. Uh, hope you're okay with us changing the ending. You already signed this contract with us and they go from there. And, and from a business perspective, it makes sense. Cause like I said, they're investing in, let's just say, you know, 10 to 50 of them. And they know that if, you know, nine out of 10 are failures, all they need is one mega hit and they're still in business. They get two and now they're hitting huge profits. Wow. This is insane. Um, this is absolutely insane. The fact that they don't care about the story it could be AI slop. They just want those main check boxes. How big is the audience? Is the art good enough? Does it meet the standard of the corporation? Um, this is this is crazy. Huh. I mean, they're going to read it. I mean, you still have to do your work to write an, an appealing story. But what they're reading, they might not read the script. You know, they're, they're going to read like the first couple of issues, your, your, your sample pages, your outlines, your synopsis. Um, but like I said, that's not probably the, the, the ending or the character development. That's not their immediate... That's not what they're looking for right away. You got to hit those other check boxes first, and then they'll assume you can just bring the goods later. That, but they're, it's not like they read the script first and they go, "That's an amazing script." I see. It, you know, at least not, at least for creator own stories. Um, but or, uh, you know, they that that's what they do is they buy something that's already finished that they assume is good based upon the pitch that you gave them. They don't have time to read everything. <laughs> Right, uh, And if they do, it's based upon the opinions of a few interns and those interns might not know or care. And they might be, that's where the arguments are is like, people might not be looking at story. They're looking at, is this, uh, you know, appealing to whatever agenda they're trying to push. Mm, there we have it. There we have it. Um, so if I were to say it is not, it is not a ridiculous claim of mine to say that the agenda currently transhumanism is one of them 
because Klaus Schwab said by 2030, we're going to merge with machines and own nothing and be happy. I don't know if you know the guy from the World Economic Forum. Um, do you know him? Uh, yes, I know that I, I know what you're talking about. The, yeah. the, I don't know what his role is at the World Economic Forum, but I, uh, the guy who looks like a, a villain that, yeah, he's yep, he, him. The World Economic Forum is sort of the true villain of the world. It's kind of crazy that it actually exists. I know. Right. And he was the guy talking throughout all of the 2020 COVID saga, you know, and he mentioned something worse than COVID would be a cyber attack and yada, yada, yada. It, it just sounded like predictable programming to me. But ultimately, these people, right, along with BlackRock and Vanguard, they kind of pay Disney off to have quotas as well to uh, fulfill these agendas. And the way I see it right now is that a lot of I think every entertainment company is operating at a loss and they're being bailed out by Vanguard and Davos, you know, and because they are doing so, it is not unfounded to think that they are going to tell them that, look, this is the agenda we want. All right. We want demoralizing dopamine head stuff because all the stories that actually inspire somebody to be wholesome genuine, strong, masculine, if he's a guy. Well, you don't see those very often anymore. There's a lot of bloody violence, absurd bloody violence. I was watching Invincible, the, the, the latest episode today, where Invincible first killed the, his first villain, right? It was the first time he killed somebody. I saw it coming. I liked his reaction to killing the guy that, you know, he didn't really want to, but... There's just the, the, the violence and the horror and the goal outweighs the morality of the characters. You know, it's a lot more vivid. The, the character's personality is not so memorable compared to the splatter of blood that you see to the point where you don't remember what they're fighting for. They are just overly powered characters killing each other. So Yeah, that's exactly kind of probably my biggest flaw in my own story, at least like the liquid kill full arc, is that I, I kind of don't give the full character development, at, at least not at the beginning, or at least not as strong as it should be as soon as it should be. I kind of pushed it too far to the end of the story, so most of what people are reading now is exactly what you're talking about, is where it's just mostly just full on violence kind of it's just character versus character and there's no real reason or real um wow. setback or like what what are they going to lose if they lose all this it's it's implied but it's but the backstories are pushed to like you know they're revealed later in the story and I, that's just my own personal i mean i'm not saying my writing is bad i actually think it's quite good there's i mean you wouldn't get to as high as i i guess you could say as reviews as you could say with it being bad i'm just saying it's not as it's not top quality like you there's a reason some of the biggest names are the biggest names like they're great writers they know what they're doing um and to your point yeah they're they're those great writers aren't what are flourishing now at some of these big corporations wow um and that's another very big point those great writers are not flourishing which yeah, that definitely is an agenda. Um, wow, that is just crazy. Well, let's see. In terms of the lack of characters knowing what they are fighting for, like it's implied, as you say, I personally think it creates more nihilism, you know, nihilism throughout the world, throughout the West, because we don't know what Goku is still fighting for at this point either. They, they just fighting, you know, for what? Beerus is not going to destroy the planet. What are you fighting for? Oh, just to get stronger. S to do what? If you have literally a God of Destruction who's going to save you from Frieza or an angel uh, that, that's above Beerus to rewind time every time you screw up. What's the point of even fighting anymore if this is the case? 
And with all these like invincible as well, what are they fighting for? They are fighting for their own selfish reasons. It's no longer got to do with the objectivity of protecting the innocent. It's all hyper individualized. And I see it as uh, demoralizing content designed to make us more selfish, more self-absorbed instead of self-sacrificing. That's what a hero is. A hero self-sacrifices, you know. But I guess um, Klaus Schwab said, no, screw that. We want people to be selfish so they can be cyborgs. You saw Elon Musk created the brain chip and he put it in somebody's head, right? Yeah, I didn't think that was it was successful yet, but I know he's trying to do that. Yeah, it is successful. I saw the video. Oh, okay. The guy was playing chess with his brain chip in his skull. So I suspect in three years, there are going to be more people with chips in their skull because they have nothing else better to do. What better way yeah, to I think experience... it's going to start with the elites. That's actually kind of like what my story is about is like the technology first is going to go to those that are trying to be superhuman. Right. And then once they're superhuman, the just in the same way that the rich get richer, the poor get poorer, the technology rises to the top and then they just take everything and no one can compete. Because, of course, it's, it's not even – you don't even need a Klaus Schwab to try to set that agenda. It's just naturally going to happen because that's what happens. Those with money buy the technology. They ultimately you know, can own that technology and then say nobody else can buy it. And then as other people try to reinvent that technology, they just shut them out. They either buy out that technology mm. and put it under their own corporation or they literally just go through the more fun stories of you know, assassinating people or whatever. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's so weird that that's actually reality, everything you just described. We are in yeah, our yeah. own <laughs> little comic book multiverse ourselves right now. We uh, live in a comic book for sure. Oh, yeah. OK, now tell us about the marketing. How did you go about marketing? I know one key thing is the artist you got. So if we were to remove him from the equation and you got some other artist that nobody knew, how would you go about marketing it? So I, I sort of, I took my education from primarily trying to market movies. I wasn't great at it, but I did all the research that I could. And I find that a lot of people that are studying comics should take a lot of insight by studying how everything else is sold throughout the world. And um, you'll learn that I also not just studying film, but I su studied almost anything else. I also buy and sell websites. I also develop a lot of things. I also sell hotel rooms. And you'll learn that virtually every, all of sales is the same thing. And the same way with that we try to capture markets in the real world and online is sort of through the same process. Now, the, the key thing with movies and comics, though, is that especially with indie comics, we tend to start by, with what's easy. And what's easy is basically other comic creators and family <clears throat> and uh, virtually people that are in your circle, uh, like directly, people that you talk to. You talk to other creators. I talk to people like you. I talk to people through my YouTube. And, I, and now what is key here is you have to consider that your team. OK, and I talk about this in my books and videos, but essentially what that means is, is everyone that you directly talk to, you have to not just consider them the sale. They are actually not the sale. They are they these are the people that are actually your salesmen. So what the mistake is, is people will start a Kickstarter and they'll be like, I need I think I can get some of my friends to do this. I think I can get some of my family to do that. I'm going to send out these posts. I'm going to do these things. I'm going to try to capture my little market. And then I'm going to go on YouTube and I'm going to go on channels. I'm going to try to capture the people that watch those channels. Now that's involved. But the key thing here is you can't make them the sale. You have to make them that you have to use them as step one so that you can get to the next level of magnitude. So let's just say that your first level of magnitude is one. That's you. Now you need to find 10 people. You, that's your friends and family. That's the other creators in the process. Those 10 need to have as much reach as possible, and they need to try to reach 100 people. The easiest way to do that is to then, the people that are in your first 10, the creators, is if you have an artist that already has an audience that also has a family. 
you know, and they have a lot of fans. Now, all of a sudden, so your initial team of 10 people, the creators, friends, and family, they, your family goes to their church. They go to their school. They go to whoever. They go to the neighborhood block party, and they bring your book with them, or they bring something, and you make them sell your book for you so that they're actually trying to reach the next, their own group of 10 people so that you can reach 100. And then the goal is, is to make that 100 people to also become salesmen. Now you do that by having great content. So that's whenever it's just like, okay, now those people are talking. Now I talk about this is like the, another way is you actually get people talking as you submit to reviewers so that you can get reviewers talking. And each person initially that you're trying to reach as a part of your team, those 10 and a hundred people, you want them to have as big of an audience as possible. And you want to give them all the information that you need to sell your book. So you're actually going to give them the book to read. You're going to give them the press release that you want them to give to people. You're going to give them almost a pre-made review or at least uh, the synopsis or like a, the blurb that you want them to post on their website. Whenever they say this book is a blah. So that's not the same as a log line. That's whenever you say like my book is whatever the matrix meets honey. I shrunk the kids and that's the kind of information you need to give to all these people. So it's not just a post. You're actually kind of telling other people what to do to sell the book for you. So that once you reach those hundred, the next thing is you want to reach that next thousand. That's where, like I was saying, where you try to go through review sites. That's where getting a publisher is helpful because whenever a publisher has its own audience. Now, what people don't know is that publishers don't do the marketing. All they do is you're initially, when you partner with a publisher, you are just, giving your rights away for their audience. So if they have 5,000 people on social media and, you know, a thousand people that read their emails and buy their stuff, you're basically saying, I'm going to give you, you know, a portion of the rights or even necessarily not the rights, but um, have them do all the printing and stuff like that in exchange for their audience. Uh, but you still have to capture that audience by creating great, what they call copy. So the copy is like the images that you give them, to be like your the promotional materials that go into the previews world in comics that's easy because it's killer covers and like i go into in like a lot of other videos and stuff is like there's there's sort of a science behind what attracts people with covers and it's exactly what you're kind of talking down upon it's like we have to attract the emotional draws and the primal forces of people we're attracted to things that are scary things with sharp teeth we're attracted to people and their faces and their emotions if they're happy if they're sad of course anything that's romantic uh we're attracted to anything like that visually so if those covers can uh, you know capture that emotional ooh, i feel a certain way based upon that image you did your job um and then the, the hardest part is reaching that like super next threshold of like ten thousand and a hundred thousand and initially that is done through influencing and you get like that's where it's like getting on channels with large youtubes and a lot of that can be sort of bought that's where you can try to get you know pay influencers to talk about your book that's where you can try if you have it's helpful if you're already in the industry and you're friends with someone that's well known uh and um an influencer in the space you can also hire great artists to do varied covers and things like that but initially th that's that's where you get luck involved is to go from 10,000 to 100,000 because you actually need good merits to reach that number. You either have a celebrity attached who automatically has that number amount. And if you don't, because indie comics is small, the only way to do it is be by just ultra. It captures people. It's a hit. The story draws them in and you can't really do that on the initial launch. You have you, that is gained over the years. There's a lot of people like George R. R. Martin that don't even reach that following until they're, done they wrote the story 10 years ago or actually in almost a lot of indie comics it's, it's the same way you don't get your real big audience that's loyal even invincible is a good example yeah. of until that series has already been out for five years and you have three trades that are out and then people the mainstream because it has to hit the mainstream talking points and that's the most books that hit that are books that hit those agenda points that you're talking about they're they hit a certain community politically or through like social means. Like it's, it's, it's got character flaws that are, you know, in the, 
whatever it is it's got some kind of group attached to that story and not just uh it's not just any old story it's a story with some kind of community attached you can it can be anything from martial arts or skateboarding or like in the more political messaging if it's got the lgbtq characters in it or something like that and then it has to be emotionally drawn to that crowd so if you can capture everybody that's into skateboarding to then buy your book or everybody that's into a certain band, that's why you see a lot of bands putting out comic books and things like that. That's a good way to reach those bigger numbers. And then if you move backwards on that, that's why you see people moving backwards on that. They're like, I'm going to get a celebrity attached. I'm going to get a band attached. I'm going to write about some kind of uh, community that is, you know, maybe lesser talked about, even though nowadays they, they might be talked about more more so. And then, uh, yeah, you just, you hit those key points. And then once again, the story is sort of factored last, assuming that it's already good. Because in order to really maintain these followers, this, the story itself and the artwork itself has to be top notch. Um, you can, you, I mean, there are other powers that can, or other factors that can overpower that, so to speak. But in the end, if you really want a loyal following, the story still has to be good. Okay. I, I, sorry for rambling. No, no, it's valid information, valuable information. We are grateful. Uh, would you say publication is worth it? After what you said, I mean, you sign off your rights or a portion of your profits uh, to get their audience. Is it worth it? Do you think there's a benefit to going that route? Hey, guys, if you want to see the full video and its context, consider joining my Patreon. That's where the real caffeine is at. Cheers.